Harris is our guest this evening. Dr. Harris is the CEO of the National Math and Science in Initiative that efforts to improve teacher effectiveness and student achievement in STEM education across the country. He's been involved in math and science education for more than 25 years through the Harris Institute and Foundation and as a founding board member of NMSI. Prior to NMSI, Dr. Harris was the CEO and managing partner of Vesalius Ventures Incorporated, a venture capital firm that invests in early to mid-stage healthcare technologies and companies. As CEO, he is responsible for managing a portfolio of operating companies and venture investment. However, you may know his name from a slightly different component of his life. Next slide, Paul. Dr. Harris is a living legend. He's the first African-American to walk in space. Yes, there he is donned in his space outfit. And there he is looking back at the world, if you can imagine that. Dr. Harris conducted research in musculoskeletal physiology and clinical investigations of space adaptation and developed in-flight medical devices to extend astronaut stays in space. He's a veteran astronaut for over 25 years and has logged more than 438 hours and traveled more than 7.2 million miles in space. And yes, he was the first African-American to walk in space. Dr. Harris is a member of the board of directors of the US Physical Therapy, JSA Health and Monibo Technologies. He serves as a trustee for the Salient Fund and Salient MF Trust, Bearings Fund and Trust. In addition, he's on the board of the National Academy of Medicine, the Texas Medical Center, Health Connect, NMSI and Harris Institute and Foundation. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Houston, a Master of Medical Science from the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, a Master of Business Administration from the University of Houston, and a Doctorate of Medicine from Texas Tech University School of Medicine. He completed his residency in internal medicine from the Mayo Clinic and a National Research Council Fellowship in endocrinology at the NASA Ames Research Center and trained as a flight surgeon at the Aerospace School of Medicine, Brooks Air Force Base. He's also a licensed private pilot and a certified scuba diver. He is the recipient of numerous awards, honorary doctorates from multiple universities, and he's been awarded the NASA Space Flight Medal, the NASA Award of Merit, and is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and a recipient of the 2000 Horatio Alger Award. He's the author of Dreamwalker, A Journey of Achievement and Inspiration. Next slide, Paul. As I prepared for this talk, I received this slide from a friend here on campus, Dr. Benjamin Levine, who's also worked um, in doing medical research with NASA, who was so pleased to hear that Dr. Harris would be speaking with us today. He, he forwarded me this picture and I thought I would share that with you. On a personal note, when I met Dr. Harris at one of the events here on campus, we were waiting for the lecture hall to open and chit chatting basically about the weather and other things happening. And in a moment I asked, what do you do? To which he said, I'm an astronaut and I almost passed out. I thought of all the things for me to ask, there's no need for me to say anything else. I've met a living legend. So it's one of those days that you walk home and say, guess who I met today? So it is my honor and pleasure to present Dr. Bernard Harris. Wow, Dr. Nesbitt, thank you uh, so much for that introduction. And uh, thank you for not reading the entire thing because uh, when people look at my my resume and especially my CV, uh, they 
they, you know, ask this question, how did you do all these things? And they say, well, you know, I still have other things I want to do because I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> and, uh, since I'm never growing up, I'm always m moving forward. But it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I want to thank the uh, students and faculty of UT Southwestern uh, Medical School. It really is uh, nice to uh, be uh, addressing you. And it's not really an address. It, it really is just a conversation uh, around uh, equity in this country, you know, uh, systemic racism, all the issues that are at the forefront of the, uh, the papers these days. And, and actually, you know, for the last, uh, last year or so that we've been dealing with. And, and I just want to offer sort of my perspective on, on that. And, and really how I feel that education is, is really the key, uh, the catalyst, so you heard me say that again, over and over again, to, uh, to change uh, in America and in fact in this world. So if, if I was to rename my, uh, my, my talk that's, you know, that, is, that was on the, the brochure, it would be, how do you succeed in, in the midst of inequality and systemic racism? Uh, and uh, I would say, looking at my background very well, if you have the, have the right attitude. So I thought I would start by sharing my, my story. And uh, it is a, a personal one. I was one of those kids who was fascinated with science and science fiction. And uh, I was just enamored with, with space. And so I was drawn to uh, becoming an astronaut you know, at a very early age. Uh, I grew up in inner city Houston, at least for the first six or seven years of my life, uh, and that's before my parents' divorce. Um, it was a very tough time. I don't know if uh, you know the Houston area, but it was an area that was called the, the West Side. We now call it the Heights. It is the trendy place to be in, in Houston. But back then, it was a very poor area. My father had just finished a stint with the Army. Uh, my mother had finished her college degree from Prairie View a and in uh, education. And I guess uh, uh, in teaching. And that was probably one of the first lessons I learned with them breaking up was that with education, she had options. My father only had uh, less, I don't even think he finished high school and had gone to the service. And his options were, were limited. So uh, that lesson was education provides options. And she executed her options. And she moved uh, her three kids to the Navajo Nation. Why the Navajo Nation? Because back in the old days, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which was responsible for providing education for uh, Native American uh, nations across the country, uh, would hire teachers to come and to teach in boarding schools. And she was one of those teachers that was hired. So I actually grew up from age seven to around 15 on the Navajo Nation. Why is that important? Because I was taken out of that poor area that I described earlier and moved to this land of Grand Canyons and painted deserts and petrified forests. If you don't know where the Navajo Nation is, it's, uh, it encompasses four states, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and, and Colorado. And so we landed in Arizona, in a place called Greasewood, Arizona. And the nice thing about there is that it was so far uh, removed from any cities that uh, when the sun would go down at night and the lights would light up ahead, uh, I just, I didn't need a telescope to look into the heavens, to look at the Milky Way galaxy and, and behind. And, and that's where my inspiration of looking to the stars began. Uh, I'm also a kid of the 60s. I call myself a civil rights kid. So in 1965, of course, we had the uh, 64 and 65, the civil rights movement and then the Voting, voting Act during that period of time. And I got to watch all of that play out on that television in front of that black and white television, as I, I always say. And on that same television screen, some years later, I got a chance to see Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon. And when they landed on the moon, 
I knew what I wanted to do. My mother being an educator would always ask me from time to time, what is it you wanna do when you grow up? And there were a few things like a kid. I had a number of things that, that I would uh, get entertained by, but this one stuck. And I remember telling a mother, I want to be an astronaut. And of course she told me like all parents do that I could be and do anything that I wanted to. And I took that to heart. We uh, subsequently moved from the Navajo Nation to uh, back to Texas, to San Antonio, where I finished up high school. And it was during this period of time where I really got serious about trying to decide on you know, what, what I would do, what would be my path to eventually get me to NASA. And uh, I studied NASA and found out that there was a doctor by the name of Joe Kerwin who was the first American physician to fly on board the Skylab mission, which was our laboratory at the time, our space lab at the time. And he spent 28 days in orbit. And I watched every, every day of that, uh, again, on that black and white television, was enamored. And so when I finished high school, I went to University of Houston to, uh, as a pre-med student. And you've heard Dr. Nesbitt talk about all the education that took me to, to get where I was to the one day applying to become an astronaut. After I had finished my fellowship uh, a few years later, I applied to the astronaut corps and I was in 1990. I always like to say that. So even for your medical students, that was a long time, time ago. I applied and was accepted as an astronaut. And as an astronaut, of course, you come in and you go through again training, uh, just like we do in medical school, except for this training involved not only space medicine, but it involved uh, how to fly jets and how to fly the shuttle, how to survive in different environments. It was probably the most comprehensive education that a person could have. And usually that's about a two year process. And then once you pass that, you become eligible for mission. And for every mission, not many people know this, but for every mission, we train two to three years in preparation for that mission. And so I flew two missions. I served as both a mission specialist and the crew medical officer on board. And on my second mission, um, became a, a payload commander. And also on my second mission, is when I did the infamous space, space walk. Just to finish my story, after spending about 10 years or so at NASA, I decided that I would get into uh, the private sector. And so I actually started uh, uh, working in business as a senior manager in a, in a small aerospace company. I eventually found out that I had no expertise in business. And so that's why you saw in my description of my education that I have an MBA, I went back so I could at least speak the language of business. And that eventually led me to starting uh, my own firm, an investment firm called Vesalius Ventures, where we focus in, in telemedicine. Why telemedicine? Because my career at NASA uh, gave me the uh, the research background, the technical background to be involved in some of the first uh, beginnings of telemedicine through NASA. You can't get any more remote than working at NASA and, and dealing with medicine uh, from afar, from here on earth. And so I, I, I participated in telemedicine, helped to uh, start some of the the uh, initiatives at NASA. And then of course, when I left NASA, then I used that expertise to start the sailing adventures, which has been around since 2002. So I, I share with you uh, that story uh, because it's an, it's an important one that sort of outlines my, my background for you in, in prepping our discussions. But you know what? I would be remiss if I did not answer a question that I always get from folks who know that, uh, that I'm an astronaut. And probably the most common question I get is, what was it like to be in space? And what was it like to, uh, to walk in space? So I can spend just a minute or so on this. I want to share with you uh, what it's like to get into space, which sometimes can be a challenge. A challenge. 
So you probably know that given my age, I flew on the, the space shuttle. The space shuttle is an amazing vehicle. Uh, many people don't know that it weighs 5 million pounds with its spaceship and the rockets that allow it to uh, be catapulted into space. And uh, with that weight, you have to light five engines that produce a thrust of seven and a half million pounds. And with that seven and a half million pounds of thrust pushing against the ground, we go in the opposite direction, hurry. So how fast? Within two minutes of liftoff, which we call our first stage, we're on the solid rocket motors. And uh, we will reach an altitude of 100,000 feet and a speed of about 2,500 miles an hour. And at that point, we're above most of the atmosphere. And so we drop off the solid rocket motors and then we have just the three main engines on the spaceship that takes on, take us on into orbit. And another six and a half minutes later, we're in orbit. But a lot happens in that six and a half minutes. We go from zero, one gravity, I guess, to uh, feeling about three times our weight. So on the acceleration of liftoff, not only is it extremely loud in the vehicle, but we're pushed back in our seat to three and a half times our weight. So I weigh about 210 pounds, and so you multiply multiply that times three and a half times and you get the experience that I feel um, on my body. But fortunately, a total of eight and a half minutes later, the main engines cut off and now you are in space in a second and experiencing zero gravity. And it's amazing. And what does being in space mean? It means that we travel to an altitude of 250 miles above the earth at a speed of 17,500 miles an hour. And at 17,500 miles an hour, we can go around the world every 90 minutes, get to see a sunset or sunrise every 45 minutes. It's an incredible view that I have from uh, in space. And we get a chance to see the earth down below. So you might've heard astronauts talk about the experience of looking down at the earth for the very first time. And I, of course, did that on my first mission inside the cabin. And my second mission, I did that outside the cabin. And what an experience. And we usually describe looking back at the Earth as probably the most beautiful sight that a person can have as you're looking down, uh, going, going around the Earth. And one of the immediate things that you notice is that there are no lines. And what do I mean by that? No lines of latitude no lines of longitude, just the planet below. And it reminds me to remind you of the view that I think that God has of us as one people on this earth. I always uh, like the joke to say, you know, people also ask me, uh, do I believe that there's life or believe in aliens? And I said, I haven't seen any, but I can tell you that I truly believe that there's life out there. But let's say if there were aliens and they came to this planet, they would come over at the earth, look down, and they would have two thoughts. One is that they would see as earthlings, not as all the separate, separate people that we categorize ourselves in, but as one people, earthlings, and either they will embrace us or they will shoot us on, on the spot. But I say all of this to say, say this that on this planet, unfortunately, we have dealt with separation in countries. We're separated within those countries, our people. That separation, unfortunately, is uh, done by either our social economic status, how much money we have, the color of our skin, our, our sex, our gender. All of these things are false. They are made up by us, they're created by our mind and our need to be superior over each other. And being in space, and being an astronaut reminds us that we're all equal, that, that we're all Earthlings. Uh, and we're on a spaceship traveling through the Milky Way galaxy, which in itself is traveling through the known universe. And just to give you a perspective, there are over 300 billion galaxies 
similar to the Milky Way galaxy in the known universe, the known universe. So to think that we have, uh, think ourselves so wonderful, I think is pretty presumptuous, presumptuous of us. So with that, I wanted to provide you that as a background. And I wanna back up and just highlight a couple of things in, in my story. And that is, I've already mentioned, that my story, my life has been highlighted by um, initiatives that were uh, supposedly to deal with the rights of, of us human beings uh, in this country, on this planet. Remind you, in 1964, we had the Civil Rights Act, uh, which I experienced as a elementary school kid. In 1965, we had the Voting Rights Act. And unfortunately, we're still dealing with the Voting Rights Act and issues around that even today. And the only thing you, you know, if you, if you need some evidence of that, look what just happened in Georgia uh, just this past week or so. In 1969, when I watched Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon, I was not only looking at them accomplishing some of the greatest feats uh, known to humankind in space. And we were all, it was, uh, we were all cheering what was happening and such a, a tremendous uh, accomplishment for human beings. We were dealing with civil rights at the same time in this country. In 1978, when I finished college, and was headed to uh, medical school, something happened. And that was uh, something called the um, Bakke decision. And I don't know if people remember that, but um, we had several challenges to affirmative action. And uh, affirmative action program, if, if I can, I did a little research, I'm just gonna give you a little history of affirmative action if I can. And, and then get back to the point I was going to make. In 1961, John F. Kennedy introduced the concept of affirmative action. In 1965, Lyndon Johnson had the executive order affirming that government uh, commitment to promoting equals, equal um, employment opportunities for all, despite you know, your background. In 1967, uh, we added, the uh, sex to the non-discriminatory act and affirmative action programs that were put in place. And in 1968, we added gender to that. So I wanna give you that sort of uh, perspective. And let me go back. So when I went to medical school, I had to deal with challenges around these acts and these executive orders around affirmative action. And I'll say to this group, and I'm not ashamed of it, that I am here addressing you as a medical doctor, uh, as an astronaut, as a venture capitalist, and now involved in philanthropy, I would not be here today if it wasn't for affirmative action programs. It has nothing to do with my qualifications or my abilities. It had to do with just society being acceptance, acceptant of my color, the color of my skin and the preconceived notions and stereotypes that uh, society had for us, and me in particular, as an African-American in this country. Well, I didn't stand by, I did, that didn't bother me at all. I took advantage of that as many uh, folks that are uh, that my age did. So I had to deal with that going into medical school. And then in residency, which I started in, um, 70, 78 through, uh, um, or 80, 82 through 85, I had to deal with another assault on uh, affirmative action. That was the Bakke decision. And I don't know if probably the student don't remember this. This was a reverse discrimination case that, uh, that uh, the Supreme Court said that, um, in fact, um, affirmative action was okay, but you couldn't use quotas. And quotas is, is a, a big misnomer, uh, a, uh, 
uh, a term that's used when people want to strike down affirmative action programs. I want to say this in closing around affirmative action, that I believe that if affirmative action had stayed in place at least a few more years and the institutions that were supporting uh, programs like the medical schools and, and universities, I think that we would not be dealing with some of the issues that we're dealing with now as a nation. That, uh, and, and, and I'll go on to say that if we are able to take advantage of the moment that we have now, where people are now again seeing the impact of systemic racism and inequality and injustice that's happening across the board, particularly in people of color, that uh, if we can deal with this now, then perhaps we would not be dealing with the same issues 30 years from now. At least that's my hope and, and that's, my, that's my prayer. And so, I guess the, the, the bottom line here for me is that I think it's so important for us to take advantage of, of this, this moment and uh, not be ashamed to get out there and, and put in the face of those in power, those policymakers, those titans of, of industry, the importance of having a diverse workforce and the impact that it's going to have on this nation. So what am I, what am I doing personally? And I am a believer that we can change as a nation. I am a believer that if all of us can pull together and uh, not be, be ashamed of talking about the issues, not being timid about it, but facing it face to face that we can come up with constructive ways to deal with the issues that, that we're dealing with now. I have chose to do it via uh, education. I think that education is a catalyst for change. And so as part of my new role as the CEO of the National Math and Science Initiative, uh, we have uh, been involved for uh, now almost 14 years in providing STEM-related education. And uh, we have done this to over 2 million students, over 65,000 educators have been a part of our program, and somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 school systems that are involved uh, in, in our programs. And I want to see or want to have us expand that significantly so we have created a program in which we call STEM Empowers. And if I can, I want to bring up, um, share my screen and just show you some of the aspects of STEM Empower, and then I think we'll go to questions. So I hope that everyone can see this. So uh, this is our, our new initiative at the National Math and Science Initiative, which we call NIMSI. You'll hear me refer to that. I think in the age of, of the 21st century where technology is driving everything that, that we do, the way that we can ensure that all communities are seen equitably and equally, and that they can equally participate in the American dream, in the international dream these days, I believe that education is at the beginning. Education provides opportunity. We believe education will enable prosperity. Education will allow us to take advantage of inclusion and deal with the social issues. And so we have created this campaign in which we are getting institutions to be partners with us to spread the word about education being the Catholics for change and the change that is so sorely need, needed in this country. So just very quickly, we have um, some descriptions of how education impacts the things in which we're doing, how STEM education can impact education and change the trajectory of our students. Uh, right now, to an example, about 17% of the teachers are actually minority teachers. Just think about that. 
in a public institution, K through 12 institution, where the majority of those students are people of color. How you can impact change is by changing the demographics of the educators. And I'm not saying that we get rid of white teachers. No, we add to that complement. We expand that with a more diversified workforce. And that, that workforce that's now teaching our young people that they are doing a culturally sensitive uh, teaching, meaning that they are taking into account the students' cultures in which they come from in order and how they deliver uh, their education and how they teach. And, and that's what we try to do at, at Menzi. Uh, STEM empowers opportunity. Uh, I mentioned that we're in the 21st century where technology is driving everything that we do. And so if you're not educated in STEM of some sort, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, I know I don't have to explain that to this group, but just in case, that, tech, that these fields are necessary no matter what field that you're involved in. This, this, this expertise in these fields is necessary no matter what field that you're involved in. It, it's uh, STEM touches that. STEM empowers prosperity. So you can't be prosperous, you can't build wealth without first having the ability to take care of yourself and then being able to then have that to take care of the communities and grow our communities. And so the best way to do that is, I think, through a four-year education. And if you're not college inclined, at least go to a vocational school where you have, you can get training in STEM so that you can get good paying jobs. So prosperity is really dependent on STEM. And social impact. The biggest issue around social impact is the disparity in wealth in this country. And so unfortunately, when we look at uh, wealth of you know, black and brown um, communities here, there is a huge gap. That we, that we have to deal with. And that gap can only be solved through education and only be solved through building, building wealth. And once you close that gap, you inherently, I believe, this is my theory being a scientist, we close the, the social uh, inequities and the social injustice that, that's happening here because now we're, we're on a more equal playing field. So those are the, uh, and then lastly, inclusion is important uh, when we talk about STEM and STEM empowers. So inclusion is, uh, is complicated, but I guarantee you that if we, are, we were socially and economically uh, more equitable, then we would not be dealing with the issues that we're dealing with in this country. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and I'm just going to uh, know I've said a lot in the last uh, 30 minutes or so. And I would love to uh, just to see if anything has sparked any, any dialogue and I'd love to have a conversation about this. Well, fantastic, thank you. We do have some questions in our Q&A box and I invite others to, to um, send forward questions. We have some uh, a good amount of time now to really explore Dr. Harris's opinions about multiple things. Um, so the first question that popped up is, what do you think about SpaceX and the future of medicine in space? Yeah, well, that that that's a uh, that's that's a softball for me being, <laughs> being involved <laughs> in space medicine. So first of all, SpaceX. Uh, commercialization of, of space is really going to allow us to accelerate what we're doing uh, in low orbit. Uh, we are uh, with SpaceX and there is Blue Origin, there is Boeing, there are a number, number of other commercial and private companies that are now involved in taking us to low Earth orbit. And you, you probably follow, follow that Elon Musk is talking about going to Mars. Um, so we're not going to be exploring space any longer with just governments. It will be governments in partnership with private industry. 
And so that's going to create a, a tremendous amount of opportunity, not only in low Earth orbit or on the moon or on the way to Mars, but here on Earth. Just as um, our exploration into space and the early Apollo programs led to all sorts of advancements like uh, defibrillators and implantable devices and imaging, um, the acceleration of technology is just going to continue. And it's going to result in, in, in just this uh, 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 tremendous amount of technology and opportunity. And so let me go back to the STEM opportunity and the STEM empowers. If you are not educated in these fields, and as these technologies are created and these industries are advanced, you're going to be left behind. And that's my biggest fear for the black and brown community is that we're, we're going to be left, left behind. In terms of space, space medicine, uh, we are going to, we're, we have lived in space for over a year. I, I think with some of these technology advancements, we are going, we're due to live on the moon by, we're going back to the moon by 2025. And the plan is to be on Mars by 2030. So think about that. Amazing, amazing. We'll see you. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's very interesting. You know, you have such a, an ex, extensive training for going to the moon, uh, but the most recent proposal is that they're taking lay people, and I'm not sure how long they're training them to go. But uh, I, I think they're not planning to take any actively trained astronauts on this next flight. I, I, would you be comfortable with that? Well, I would not exactly say that, <laughs> So right now, SpaceX is, is taking NASA-trained astronauts. So the, they're okay. sort of like a, a taxi service or a limo service, right? So they build the vehicle. We contract out with them to take our astronauts out. Now, they are also planning on having a private group of astronauts that will go through a similar training program, probably not as ex extensive as, as our training, uh, because the systems are uh, a lot, in many ways, a lot easier and a lot more sophisticated. There'll be more uh, AI involved and more automation involved in going, to, going into space. OK, that makes sense. All right, another of our questions, what advice do you have for underrepresented minority students that want to work at the crossroads of medicine and business? Yeah, so get educated in both, right? So if you're in medical school, uh, get your medical training, whatever that is, if, if it's being a physician, I would also advise you, you uh, get training in a specialty or a subspecialty. Right? Not just go to medical school and just get the medical degree. Get your subspecialty training because that's going to help you. It gives you a lot more, uh, lot, lot more options. And then if you want to go into business, do as I did. Go and get a business education. You can do that through a formal education with an MBA. Or there are a number of business schools that offer programs where you can come in for um, uh, a period of time. They're, they're like uh, executive programs where you come in for two, three, four month period where you get the foundation for an MBA and you, you get the expertise and that allows you to have, um, have the, the business uh, acumen that you're going to need to get involved. And then the next thing after you get that education is go out and get some world experience. Uh, nothing teaches you better than going out and working for a company. And so if you're thinking about being part of a large company, go out and get large company experience. If you're thinking about being involved in a startup, I get asked by a lot of medical uh, students these days that you know, I want to do and go and get a startup. Guess what my advice is? Go and work for a large company first. Ah. Because that will give you, if you can go and work for a large company, let's say it's for GE. Um, or, you know, Medtronics. What happens there is that you learn the, uh, the workings of how a, a large successful company operates. And if you get trained in the various areas, when you get out, you'll have the requisite knowledge in order to run your own company. 
But just to jump out there on your own and think, well, I'm going to automatically become this entrepreneur uh, can be challenging. And that's a harder way to do way to go. That would be my advice. Good advice. Well, my, my division chief, Dr. Hill, asked, uh, he says, what an inspiring story. As someone who has seen planet Earth without the artificial political, really religious, racial, and, and much more boundaries, are you optimistic about the future or have the events in the recent months, years tempered any optimism? And uh, he says, you can tell us straight. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the straight scoop is, you know, if, uh, a year ago, you know, um, this, this, this 2020 has been a challenging year for all of us, you know, with COVID and, and with uh, George Floyd and all the others. Um, that's when, if I just focus on that, I really get pessimistic about our future. It's like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Are we still dealing with the same issues? As I said before, we had an opportunity 30, 30 years ago to make a difference. And we elected not to continue with programs that could help move uh, our communities forward, at least forward enough. We made some progress, but not enough progress to make a, a systemic change within, within our community. So we're dealing with the same issues. Uh, I'm pessimistic about the perceptions of some in the U.S. who still carry those, those prejudices, those stereotypes that, um, you know, we kind of go, but we're in the 21st century. You know, we're, we're not back in slavery times, but yet there are some folks who are, are uh, still think that way. So that's my pessimistic side. My optimistic side is to see in the marches that ensued uh, over the last few years, those marches have not just been black people and brown people, there have been people of all races and colors and sex and gender that have been out marching uh, in support of change. That makes me optimistic about, about the US, about where, where we're headed. If we can, hold on to that and keep that, that view in front of us and that vision of truly uh, United States and the world. Remember, this is, this is not just happening in the United States. This is happening in a lot of countries around the world. If we can hold that view, as I say that God's eye view, of, uh, of us on this planet, of people on this planet, there is hope for us. And I'm, I'm, I'm a hopeful person by nature. Thank you. I, I, I'm hoping that you're absolutely 100% right. Our next question, uh, the NEMSI program sounds really awesome. I imagine the impact is huge. I'm curious if you partner with other organizations that teach financial literacy, Many students of my generation have gone into STEM fields, but have, haven't learned much about growing wealth. What are your thoughts about that? Yes, I remind people that our focus is STEM and guess what, finance, financial uh, literacy is STEM, right? It's the math of, of, part, of part of that and, and other pieces, but certainly. And so uh, we do, we have a, a financial literacy program that we do uh, in concert with uh, the uh, FEDS, uh, Federal Reserve, and also with uh, uh, Capital One uh, right now. And we're talking to other banks uh, about how do we provide financial literacy, not only to the students so that they can learn how to not only balance a checkbook, but you know, what, it, what a credit report is, you know, and what, you know, how credit cards can do you in if you're, if you're not, you know, paying attention. And, uh, but also provide that similar type of uh, knowledge to their parents. And so we look at it as, you know, um, a 360, you know, you, you have to teach the parents too and, and the students. So yes, we were involved in financial literacy. Okay. That's absolutely needed for, across many disciplines, I will say. 
Our next question, how do parents enroll their school age children in STEM education if it's not formally offered? For instance, ways to prepare in the area of math and science. Yeah, so we actually uh, have a, a way in which you can go and, and uh, explore our programs. So if you go to nms.org, nationalmathandscience.org, just nms.org, you'll see a list of our programs. And we actually have on-demand courses uh, for both teachers and students. Um, our programs uh, involve um, advanced placement in, for high school students. We provide support for teachers and students K through 12 through our program called Laying the Foundation. So you'll see, see that. And if you happen to be in college and uh, majoring in STEM, and you want to become a, a teacher, we actually have a program for that. So we're involved in teacher preparation in about 65 uh, universities at, uh, around the nation. So go to that website and uh, you know, kind of sift through it. And uh, you can always reach out to me and, and there should be a way you can reach out to uh, get help on the website so you can see what we're doing. Um, we are starting a, a program in support of rural students and also homeschool, uh, homeschooling parents too. Fantastic. Um, have you developed specifically programs during COVID given you know, the demands of uh, remote education over the past year? That's exactly right. You'll be before COVID, we were doing what we call blended learning where we brought students to uh, either we would go to students or they would come to a prescribed place the same thing with teachers and so when COVID hit nobody could meet in person so we shifted all of our program to online so uh, the programs that i'm talking about all those are available online so you can access the, those online fantastic so we, we plan as schools open up we, we plan to go back to the blended but we're going to be doing a lot of online training too great COVID has been an opportunity, as much as it's been a, a difficult time, it's an opportunity for us to learn about how we can uh, teach some of these things a little more broadly without having to stretch ourselves to every single small school. It's um, interesting that way. Yeah, and even, uh, even as we get back in person, <laughs> I think that you know, there's, there's issues, there is discrepancy and inequality, maybe I should say, amongst school systems. Um, some schools are better than others. Some systems are better than others. And so providing online education and access to online education can help supplement uh, your students' uh, education. Fantastic. Dr. Levine, whom you know, uh, says Bernard, millions of kids look up at the sky and want to be astronauts. Why do you think NASA chose you as opposed to others of tens of thousands of candidates who applied when you did? Wow, that's a good question. I wish I could say because I was the smartest, most intelligent <laughs> candidate that they had, and that would not be true. <laughs> because each class has thousands of folks that apply. In my class, there were over 6,000 applicants and they selected only 23. Wow. I'd like to think that that part of it is um, I was sort of intentional. You know, you've heard my story, wanted to be an astronaut since I was 13 years old, you know, 1969. I purposely set out to become a medical doctor when I left Mayo Clinic. I got a fellowship in endocrinology. I studied bone uh, loss. I picked the the issue, one of the biggest issues that we have with people living in space, and that is we lose 1% of bone per month uh, on orbit. And so I became an expert in that. Uh, when I uh, joined Johnson Space Center, I helped to create uh, some of the medical equipment and technology that's now on board the International Space Station. So in, in some respects, I took my medical training, built on that, and used it in a way that NASA saw was useful. And still and yet, that just gave me the entry into the, into the door. It gave me the ticket into the door. Why they selected me, who knows? 
I'm hoping <laughs> it's part of that. <laughs> well, I think it was a good choice. <laughs> uh, let's see, our next question, is there an established career path for space medicine? And do you know of any opportunities that might help someone to explore this career? Yes, there are. So one of the things that, that I did uh, on my way to becoming an astronaut, uh, I, I just mentioned that I worked at NASA before becoming an astronaut in what we call life sciences. It's like the medical branch at NASA. And uh, part of that work was that I became a flight surgeon. A flight surgeon is a person who takes care of flight crew, whether you're flying jets here on Earth or, or astronauts in, in space. And so we created a pathway to be becoming a uh, flight surgeon and also a special, uh, having a subspecialty in space medicine. And we did that at UTMB, University of Texas Medical Branch. And so we have an aerospace space medicine residency. And the requirement for that is that you must have a primary residency before you go to this residency. So internal medicine, emergency medicine, and then you can apply to aerospace medicine. I actually became a flight surgeon through the Air Force. And I think Dr. Nesbitt, you talked about Brooks Air Force Base. So I actually went to the Air Force uh, to get my aerospace medicine training. But now we have not only the military way in which to get in, but a civilian way down at UTMB, and then also at Bright Path. It's also um, with, uh, I believe it's uh, University of Ohio, I believe, uh, too. So there are several ways to get there. Wow. Uh, next question from Dr. Duran. This is very inspiring. Thank you for sharing your story with us. What are the types of potential physiological and psychological issues that you foresee space travelers facing in the future as we take longer and extended trips into space? Yes, the, the big issue uh, with humans in space is something called space adaptation syndrome. And that is just a big long word to say that when a body is developed in a one gravity environment and we take it to a microgravity environment, the body adapts. The reason that we have all the different flavors and colors on this planet is because of, of adaptation over you know, thousands of years, human adaptation over thousands of years. So it's only natural if we go to a different environment like microgravity, either on the moon or in orbit on, on the surface of Mars, that the body begins to adapt to that environment. And some of, some of that adaptation is good, and some of it is, is bad. And so our job as a, um, as a you know, the crew medical often researchers is to figure out those things. So just to give you an out, I mentioned we lose 1% of bone per month. We lose about 15, 20% of our muscle mass using our anti-gravity muscles. Our heart gets smaller, our immune system changes. And with our twin studies that we did with the two astronauts that were twins, one on the ground and one, one in space for a year, we found that even the genome changes. So we change at the genetic level, which really kind of makes, makes sense. So we've got to solve those issues before we can spend long periods of time in space. And so for the International Space Station, we uh, the crew exercises one to two hours a day in orbit in order to stay in shape up there. And we're exploring ways in which to freeze the bone uh, using uh, bisphosphates, uh, very similar to what we use with osteoporosis down here on the ground. And so there, there's a lot of research that's going on in the International Space Station in preparation for those missions. Very interesting. Um, let's see. Well, I've been asked to share your best contact uh, information to get further advice. Yeah, so you can reach me at bharris at nms.org. We can put that in the chat box um, for, for others to see. Uh, next question, astronauts are brave to travel in space. How are you able to overcome those fears? Uh, because I'm an American astronaut, I have no fear, of course. <laughs> no. you know, I, I described to you the liftoff. That's probably one of the scariest moments, especially when you do it for the first time. 
and my first time didn't go well. So I like to describe, I had three missions, but only two went into space because my first liftoff failed. We had a failure on the, on the launch pad where one of the engines actually not only failed, but caught on fire. And oh, I got wow. to watch from my seat in the spaceship of a fire, hydrogen fire rolling up the side of the vehicle. Now, if that's not scary, I don't know what is. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> Fortunately, we, we were, they were able to put out the fire and we were able to get out. And uh, we stood down for about a month and in that same vehicle with new engines, of course, we, we lifted off uh, safely uh, on orbit. Um, there is not a mission that goes off when there is not a, a malfunction. We, we train uh, for those. And uh, that training helps you during those scary times. Probably the second scary time is opening up the hatch for, to do my spacewalk for the very first time and stepping out into nothingness. That, that we like to describe that as astronauts is that got my attention. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine just stepping into not having anything under your feet would be more than enough for me. <laughs> Um, so I, I just heard that one of our chief residents from Parkland actually um, is John Marshall is currently doing an aerospace medicine residency at UTMB. Thank so some, some folks are really uh, interested and engaged in that even from UT Southwestern. Uh, it just struck me when you described the feeling of taking off and having, you know, basically 800 pounds, uh, you know, a force against your body. It's interesting to think about not only what that feels like, but also what effect that has on your muscles um, and, and also the uh, cardiovascular structure is having that much pressure on you. About how long do you feel that level of intensity of pressure? Yeah, so about uh, six minutes or so. Um, it's a long time. It, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a long time. It doesn't seem like it's a long time, but when you have that pressure on your chest, you have to consciously tell yourself to breathe. So every you know few seconds, you take a deep breath, and um, you can breathe, but it's it's a conscious thing, and it's a great relief when those main engines shut down. You no longer have that force pushing you. Then you immediately go into zero gravity within a split second. Everything begins to float in front of you. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's somehow seems more frightening than <laughs> for me. Next question, any ideas on how primary education teachers in schools where resources are limited can promote STEM in the classroom? Yes, um, I think by talking about it is the first thing, right? I think for, for teachers, it's so important for you to connect the dots for the, for the students. It's so easy to get into just learning. So, you know, you, you've got your workbook as, a, as an educator, you've got your workbook. It tells you you're supposed to say this thing and that thing, and then the kids have their workbook and all that sort of thing. It doesn't come to life until you make it come to life, until you share personal stories or you make that connection with what you're learning in math and what you're learning in science connects to something real life. That's, that's how we do it. Um, in education, we call that project-based learning. So they learn around doing projects and doing hands-on type of uh, type of work. And then it's it's uh, and, and that requires a lot of time that uh, educators must do research. They must go and figure out how to connect the dots so, to make it so it's relatable to to the students. And then point them to resources where they can learn on their own. Fabulous. Uh, we have a medical student question. Christopher Joseph asks, he's an MS3 at UT Southwestern and taking a research year working at SpaceX, starting uh -huh. doing some part-time work with them last December. And uh, thank you all for setting this up and has been a great experience and inspirational story for him to hear. So, um, so there are lots of ways that you can engage in, in learning about space. So earlier and earlier. Yes. Um, another, what kind of roles are available for those with basic biological research backgrounds in, in NASA? So just about every field is represented at NASA. 
in some form or fa fashion, you know, engineering, biology, chemistry, um, physics. Um, so every aspect that's there. So I, I would say you can find a job. Uh, we have seven different centers, NASA centers across, across the country, and each of them specialize in certain areas. And so we have centers that specialize in astrophysics. Uh, JPL, for example, is responsible for the, the recent launch to Mars. Uh, so we want to get into rocketry. Uh, Johnson Space Center uh, right here in Houston, Texas, uh, focuses on, on the human side. This is where the astronauts are and the, and the flight surgeons. Uh, Kennedy is specializes, of course, in launch vehicles. So there, there are just a plethora of opportunities for you. Amazing. So as you mentioned, ways, uh, the experiential learning, it's, it's one of the concepts that I've had in mind over the last couple of years around learning about really dealing with um, minority populations is I think experiential learning is a very important part of that. Similar to the way you, you talk about it for teaching science and STEM to early education. Um, but as you mentioned, it does require some preparation on the part of the, the teachers. What sort of uh, changes do you think we need to think about in our education system to allow our teachers to be really prepared to do that in, in a, a very serious way? And I guess the, the corollary to that question is, um, what would you say is the number one issue that our Department of Education should embark on in order to um, reduce this inequity and, and, uh, in STEM education? Yeah, it's making sure that, that students have adequate education. I think it's, it's a big deal. I've got the sun in my face here. Ah. <laughs> Take this down a second. Okay. And um, so making sure that uh, the teachers have the resources that they need, uh, that includes professional development. Um, many people don't realize that most educators go to colleges of education and where they get a broad education uh, around how to teach. Uh, but then when they go to schools, then they may get assigned, especially in high school, to teach physics or biology or chemistry. And you know, most school systems, districts try to find teachers that have expertise in those areas. But in many of our, our school districts, it's a teacher who has to learn uh, that subject. And so one of the things that we do at NIMSI is that we provide that STEM-based uh, education to help, help them. And so I, I think that is the thing. So making sure that they have the resources um, and professional development, the learning uh, that teachers have to do, just like, just like being a medical doctor, right? We never stop learning because okay. our field changes constantly. The same thing in this society where Again, technology is involved in everything we do. We, it, it's, it's changing constantly. And so our, our education system and our teachers have to change also. Well, it's been an absolutely delightful, inspiring, and, and truly engaging conversation. And, and I wish we could go on longer, but we promised one hour and I want to stick to our time limitations. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for spending this hour with us and uh, sharing so much about what you're doing, what you have done, and your own journey. Uh, I'm sure that our students, residents, faculty and staff who listen today and those who will listen to this as a rebroadcast uh, will also learn so much from you. And, and thank you for being a legend and a trailblazer. That's, uh, you know, we need legends. We need those voices of people who've traversed the way and have broken the barriers in, in multiple ways, literally and also figuratively. So um, thank you. I, um, <laughs> Dr. Levine has shared a wonderful quote and it's long, but, and I, I'm so sorry, Ben, but I am un, incapable of being able to cut and paste it <laughs> in the way that it needs to be, but uh, we'll find some other way to share it. To all of you this evening, thank you so much for tuning in. I assure you we will have uh, our next lecture. We're looking for our next speaker um, in April and we'll be in touch with you about our next anti-racism virtual lecture series lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.